Dennis Report is in-depth media for New Brunswick. We are supported by viewers just like you. If you'd like to support the show, go to thedennisreport.ca and click on PayPal or Patreon. Today's guest is Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance Party in New Brunswick. 18 months now, more or less, been an MLA in the legislature, and thanks for taking the time, Chris. Good to be here, Dennis. Always a pleasure. So most people do not understand what it's like to be an MLA. There's only 49 a year that mm-hmm. kind of get to experience that. Um, media described you as coming out of nowhere, even though you've been doing it for eight years before mm-hmm. you got in. Right. And now it's been 18 months, and it's an interesting beast at the legislature because mm-hmm. of the four-way conversation. So a c- couple of personal words, what it's, what it's been like for you. Uh, you know, I'd say the first first come well coming up to a year and a half um a lot of it to be honest has been a learning curve i mean Mm -hmm. i've always understood politics in general and and trying to get the mindset of the people and you know what would make sense in government and that type of thing but when you get in the legislature um to be honest it's overwhelming i mean the, the the first especially you know i always use the example if you're elected under the one of the two main parties when you're an mla going in there you have that party infrastructure that apparatus in place to kind of guide the MLAs and what they need to do what they can do what they can't do where to sit and all that sort of thing Um, our challenge was we went in with none of that so we're fresh right Uh, trying to learn that I'm sure um, David Kuhn understood that too when he first got elected and and of course he's been there now for for long enough that he's got a better understanding so the first year was a lot of just learning procedures uh, traditions um, you know, again, when to speak, when not to speak, uh, and I, you know, when you're on the outside looking in, um, you don't see the whole operation, of course. So, you know, people ask me, well, why are you only asking, you know, two questions in question period? And I say, well, because that's the schedule the legislature sets. That we don't choose that; that's what they give us. So, you know, and they base it on the, the amount of seats in the legislature. So, there's a whole, you know, uh, um, plethora of of challenges in terms of learning the procedures and and how it works like we were saying before we started it would be really good to have a documentary where it followed one mla from each of the four parties around for Mm -hmm. a week cut that into a documentary of some sort so that the public when they go to vote or when they're watching a mainstream news piece Mm -hmm. they've got a different understanding what a day in the life is like yep for an mla of of any organization or any political party um, that would offset the constant rant. Um, oh, you're all crooks. You yeah. Know, you didn't know that before you started. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or you're all in it for the money. Oh, yes. Or yeah. stuff. There's a small percentage that benefit. Um, I think there's new rules in place about mm-hmm. um, you can't benefit from your political office until two or three years later. Right. Whether or not that's enforced, I don't know. But mm-hmm. um, But there have been attempts to quell that public's reaction Mm -hmm. but if there was a bit more heart and a bit more kindness Mm -hmm. on the general public side Mm -hmm. it might take some of the pressure off rookie mlas trying to figure out the ropes yeah yeah (laughs) and 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 i think a lot of it too is just just understanding right and 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 i get it i mean when you're not involved in politics and you go to work every day and you come home and you read a headline on the news or you know you hear a story somewhere about about the political sphere um you know it's you don't get the full picture right of course yeah. and and you know i mean it, it's always important that the public and and opposition parties uh, you know keep that critical eye on government it keeps everybody accountable but at the same time yeah a little bit of uh understanding i think <laughs> and how it works yeah and and to wander into that even further um new brunswick's trying to negotiate its way through something that's brand new mm-hmm. which is the four-way conversation in the yep. legislature and it, it would be really nice at some point too if if indigenous peoples were part of that at the beginning instead of mm-hmm. kind of oh we've already decided this now we have to go to you and consult it's right like, no you need to include a lot right. earlier that five-way conversation would make for a very dynamic kind of decision making process mm-hmm. so what's that been like trying to do something that's never been done before. If this was the the sports world, uh, this would go down as a moment in jock history, yeah. you know, yeah. where this team kind of came out of nowhere and, and accomplished this, like uh, overshot their mm-hmm. skill sets. I mean that as a province as a whole. Yeah. And, and to cut some slack for the fact that it's going to take a while to figure out that four-way conversation. For sure. For sure. And, uh, you know, I was very proud um, 
people with us as a party and the people of the province that they chose this direction of a minority government. First time in over 100 years. I mean, that's impressive. Uh, but it was funny because when we first get in, um, you know, I said we were fresh as a political party. Well, the legislature infrastructure and the staff, they were new to a minority situation. So that was a whole new ball game for them. And I remember it was, you know, within the first month or two um, of, of the House sitting, I remember we would go to uh, the, the deputy clerk or the clerk of the legislature and say, okay, so this bill's coming down, um, you know, or a committee's coming forward, you know, how does this work? How, how do the votes go and all this sort of thing? And, and I remember, you know, there were several occasions where the clerk would look back and say, I don't know, because I've never seen a minority situation like this, more towards committees and how the committee structure works. Mm. But the impressive thing is with the minority situation, no one party carries all the weight. So, you know, in this case, it's the it's the Conservative Party that has to rely on somebody else to get their bills passed. So, and even the committee structure behind is a whole different way of doing it, where before, if a bill was drafted, it would be brought to committee. And committee really is where you really dig into the, meets, the, 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 the meat of the issue. Um, so before, under majority governments, the, 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 the government controlled the committee just by sheer numbers. So they could basically just rubber stamp through committee and away it goes. But now, in a minority situation, the opposition parties control the committees. So government can't just push through things in committee. It's, it's, it's better for the people as a whole because it, it, it makes the process more rigorous in, in the details of bills and, and uh, other issues that come forward. So two things off of that, and thank you for that. One, one of the long-running narratives in New Brunswick is that it doesn't matter who you elect, it's going to be the backroom people who are controlling all the decision making in mm -hmm. the province. Um, that description you just gave of minority parties controlling the committee work, mm -hmm. um, that almost by definition takes away a high percentage of that control of the leveraging, um, the influencing, whatever you want to call it. Ab absolutely. And, uh, and again, that's why minority governments are good in terms of public accountability because mm -hmm. Again, no, no one party has, has full, uh, full sway over, over the committee work, which, which really is the, the meat of, of the bills and, and the reports that come out. So the second side of that, the exact opposite, is that that's exactly why minority governments can't get anything done. Um, well, I think we've proved that wrong, right, in the last year and a half, because, um, you know, and, and again, committee simply recommends. So if, if government or any party put forward a bill... Um, that bill oftentimes will go to committee. The committee will study the bill, ask questions of the bill, bring in people that are related to the bill, professionals, experts, whatever. Um, but then once the committee work is done, they simply make a recommendation so they don't really have any power to pull the bill or do anything like that. Uh, the bill still has to be voted on by the whole House and the legislature. So, And I mean... That, that, that's a big argument, right? I mean, before the election, people would say, you know, if if, uh, if we elect the People's Alliance, well, you're not going to get anything done. Or, you know, if there's a minority government, uh, you know, there'll be instability and you won't be able to pass bills and all that. But we've proved all of that wrong. Um, you know, throughout the last 18 months, we were able to get a significant amount done. Balanced budgets was a big one. Um, but it's working. I You know, I'm confident it's working uh, in the best interest of New Brunswick. Mainstream media, in particular a few uh, people within the media, keep framing what you just described as um, you're propping up the conservatives or that you're in bed with the conservatives or if it wasn't for you guys, the conservatives would tumble. Um, usually a conflict-based, usually a dysfunctional kind of undertone yeah. to it all. Yeah. Rather than this is kind of what a minority government walks and talks like, right. even though we've not seen one before. Mm -hmm. So that instinct from mainstream media to push it back into the old standard or the old narrative of right. us and them, right. um, that must get frustrating at times because you must on the inside experience, you know, we actually all cooperated on this mm -hmm. and then it got to the floor and then we all debated it mm -hmm. and then it happened. Right. And this is for a bunch of people that even has a, a clerk that doesn't know how to structure the, the house you know, right. or... or, or so to even get stuff done, given that it's a first, it'd be like, a, here's some sticks and some pucks, and you guys go figure out how to play hockey, right. and you figured out how to get into the playoffs. Right, you know? right. 
but the media don't frame it that way. Yeah. They frame it that you're propping somebody up. Well, and, and that is, that, that's frustrating. And, and that's why we said from the start, we're not going to, you know, sign any formal agreements with, with uh, conservatives. Uh, we want to do it on a bill by bill basis. But there, there does have to be a mutual understanding between us and the conservatives because they need to know they have, you know, some support there to be able to move forward on, on important files. Mm. Um, but it's also coming upon us that they know in order to get that support, there's a certain amount mm. that, that we expect in return. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, meetings and talking on, on different items and issues that come forward. Um, but again, there's been disagreements too. I mean, there's sure. been times, and, and if you look at the makeup of the legislature over the past year and a half, um, there's bills we have not supported that the Conservatives have brought forward. There's bills that uh, the Greens, for example, have brought forward that we have supported. So, you know, it's it's a it's a mixture of, of different things. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. Yeah. This is what it walks and talks like. Yeah. Um, when mentioning uh, David and um, and the Green Party, uh, have there been instances where you six are together on something and it creates a, an interesting tipping point? Yeah. Um, well, the latest one here, that would be about a month and a half ago. Actually, I think it was before the holidays. Um, uh, Mr. Coon brought forward a, a bill on the forestry and, and glyphosate spraying was part of that bill. Mm -hmm. So we supported uh, that aspect of the bill on, on glyphosate. There was uh, our three... Uh, MLAs and the three green MLAs. Now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. we only have six of 49 seats. Yep. Right. So, I mean, it did not get passed because the the, the conservatives and the liberals voted against it. So. So, did the media describe the liberals as propping up the conservatives? <laughs> no, but good boy. The, you know, there, that it, should be the headline. You know, it's like, hello, because <laughs> yeah. that's a four-way minority government. Mm -hmm. um, imagine if there was 49 independent MLAs. Right. And like a municipal council. Yeah. And they're responsible for making the thing work. Yeah, exactly. Quick story. Um, a book by Judy Steed, Pursuit of Power, about Ed Broadbent when he became um, leader of the opposition. And uh, it was during the Trudeau era. And it was about minority governments and all of the change that happened in Canada in that window of time. Mm -hmm. And in that book, there's a story, I'll paraphrase as best I can where um, the NDP had a whole list of changes, progressive changes they wanted. It was the last time we had a major bump in health care changes and such. Right. <clears throat> and the West had given Mr. Broadman a lot of his support. <clears throat> um, at that time, Trudeau was trying to implement the national energy strategy. <laughs> so uh, the way Broadbent tells the story, more or less, is I, so I'm invited to the Prime Minister's office the day after the election. Congratulations on becoming official uh, opposition. Um, Here's the things I'll put in from your orange book, mm -hmm. and here's the thing I want from you from right. my red book, which is the national energy thing. And Broadbent said, you know, in a minority government, uh, politically I'm kind of stuck strategically, mm -hmm. but in terms of caring for people, right. it was quite good because here the liberals will implement if we support them. Right. All these things that were part of our platform. Right. But the one thing I know I could never support, which is this national energy policy, because mm -hmm. it would undermine my western support because they won't listen it'll get emotional right which is what we're still seeing today right right <laughs> i thought what an interesting peek to the inside of uh, and then if uh, of how that mechanic works which mm -hmm. is what i'm imagining you've got some of that going on now yeah, yeah, and if public just understood but mm -hmm. that dance like that call it compromise or co cooperation doesn't mm -hmm. matter but that's how things shift. And yeah. Canada experienced this biggest degree of shift during that window. Right. So if you and the Green Party can sustain this kind of structure right. for the next two, three years, mm -hmm. we might, in New Brunswick, finally see a shift from things that we've had be quite static since the mid-60s in the right. Equal Opportunities Act. Yeah, it, for sure. And, and again, it, it goes back to the traditional way of government functioning where... Uh, you had either the red or the blue governing, and whoever wasn't governing was in perpetual opposition. So, but it was it was opposition that couldn't really affect change, right? So, the government would put forward a bill. <coughs> excuse me, the opposition, whoever that would be, would oppose the bill, just knee jerk reaction mm -hmm. most times, um, but not really be able to to do any significant change because the majority lies with the government. But again, with this situation. It's a whole different uh, ball game. 
I guess the, 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 the challenge for me as a leader and for my caucus and Rick and Michelle is finding that fine line between um, you know, showing the public that minority governments can work and that they can be stable. People don't want an election every year. Uh, they want to know the government can continue on. So it's, it's finding that fine line between providing that stability in government and having that compromise to get some things done without totally compromising your, your, your policies and your ideas as a party. So there, there is some hard lines that we've had to take in the past. And, and to be fair, the Conservatives have had to take hard lines with us in the past. So when you call it a dance, it's, it's, a, it's a good terminology to, to explain it. Hmm. And, and thanks for wandering into that because um, it takes us away from the conflict narrative that tends to emerge around politics mm -hmm. and into at least a small glimmer inside of uh, everyone's kind of feeling their way through this. Right. Um, so maybe patience is called for and a bit of kindness, oddly mm -hmm. enough, yep. rather than, oh, let's put it back to the way it always was, so let's call an election, let's try right. to get a majority government, and people will be complaining within six months yep. that, oh, the backroom people are back into leveraging what policies are coming through. Yeah, and I really get the impression, Dennis, and I, I don't know, I mean, some, I guess people do to figure this out, but... I get the impression that most New Brunswickers like what they see as a whole. Um, you know, everybody's got their own leanings toward whatever policies and, and party are in play, but I think they like the, the minority situation. And, and again, my role is to make sure that it, it, it provides the stability uh, without, you know, completely giving away the farm, right? It's, it's, it's working and finding that balance. A uh, recent article out of CBC I wanted to refer to. It's January 10th, so it's pretty recent. Um, only two things are listed in the article that were uh, examples of um, cooperation and getting some things through. So in return, the PCs have acted on some alliance policies, including reclassifying ambulance paramedics mm -hmm. and the frequency of car inspections. Now, the follow-up on the car inspection one was about, oh, whoop de doo we don't have a front license plate. Oh, mm -hmm. whoop de doo we don't. It saved us nickels and dimes. Um, in behind the scenes, unreported, was there more that was done that you can account for where they didn't do it with CBC. Uh, that it's, you no, know, here's examples of how we collaborated and it moved the needle from here to here. Right. Um, I'm thinking of, a, and there'll be some hot ones we got to get into, the mm -hmm. nursing home mm -hmm. workers issue, yep. um, the glyphosate issue to a degree because there's a bit of blowback about that because it wasn't enough for some people. Right. Um, can you take it larger than what... Um, was done by CBC that it's, you know, license plates and the paramedics. Yeah, well, what I would say is is every bill or, or piece of legislation that's brought to the House, um, you know, we, we certainly have eyes on and we have influence. So so a lot of times they may say, well, the People's Alliance didn't put any amendments out. Well, we didn't need to because we already had the bill reformatted before it came to the floor, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, talking about Bill 17, the Nursing Home Workers Bill, um, that was one, for example, that the government, that was their hard line, right? They, they, you know, the premier made it very clear, um, you know, that would be an election call if, he, if that was not supported. So when they had their bill out on that, um, our research staff, and, and, you know, I gave them kudos because they really dug into that. And they looked at other jurisdictions that had similar legislation. What they found is, like, for example, in Ontario, legislation has been there for well over a decade, um, you know, it had certain certain uh, guidelines for the arbitrator on ability to pay, but it also had in Ontario, uh, specifically in the legislation, that the arbitrator could seek out other relevant factors. So what that did was that opened it up. So so the arbitrator, in, in awarding a decision to the unions, government, in, in negotiations, the arbitrator could be broad. He could he or she could look beyond just you know a box scope. When we saw the bill that was originally presented by the government, they removed that aspect. So it was originally a very boxed uh, view. And, and the question we had was, would that even stand up in court, right? I mean, there, there could be challenges to that. So we, we, we found that uh, flaw. And as a result, we demanded that the amendment be put into that bill to, again, broaden it so the arbitrator can look beyond just the parameters set out in the original bill. When you describe it as it can expand its parameters, um, one of the things that's always crossed my mind when it comes to union contract negotiations, mm -hmm. and in squirrel moment, um, people will be watching this um, 
And then at some point, the deal's signed and done, mm-hmm. and they're going to be right back in negotiation because it's already three years, right. three and a half years late. Yeah. And people will be thinking, wait a second, I thought they just signed something. Say, no, this actually started three years ago, so it goes back to the liberals. Right. And they didn't want to do it before an election period. Yep. And then it's a minority government, so the whole schmozzle. Now, try to imagine being one of the employees or one of the workers under that, right. not knowing what's coming. Um and having worked a bit in the union structure for seven years as a communications person, listening mm-hmm. to the stories, listening to the narrative, you know, and that box about you can go bigger than just these constraints. Right. Time is sometimes more valuable than dollars. Right. Mainstream media will frame any negotiation as a dollars issue. There's an awful lot of union members that would prefer to have a day or a different structure to their work day. Mm-hmm that allows for some days together. Mm -hmm. Um, Does that ever sneak into it? Um, The QP bunch will do their fist thing and Mm kind of make you clench a little bit before you even want to get into negotiation because they'll do their style of demanding to protect their workers' rights. When you look at the percentage increase, it doesn't keep up with cost of living, the consumer price index. And yet the government will say, we don't have any money. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there's seniors (laughs) and in homes and facilities and, and at home that need care. Yep. So we're framing it as a tough negative mm-hmm. and somebody's going to lose here. Mm-hmm. Rather than framing it as a positive, well, instead of moving money around, what if we move time around? Right. Well, yeah, and, and my biggest frustration uh, through this all, and it gets back to being in a minority situation where, yes, we support the government in continuing in, in, the, in, the, in you know, governing, uh, but you're not in government, right? So we're not directly involved in negotiations because we're not in government. But we've had many meetings with QP leadership. We've had many meetings with government trying to bring the two sides together. Um, and and, and that, that is the challenge. So for us, the, for me, the biggest frustration was we sit at the table and we talk about wages. And frankly, that's pretty much all that's discussed. They don't talk about flex times. They don't. Well, you know, they throw it out here and there, but it's not. It's not the focus. The focus was always wages, and and this is what bothered me, both from the government side and the union side, because I'm thinking nursing homes are in a mess. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at hours of care. You can look at working conditions. When the union, when union members come and they say the working conditions are bad in the, in the nursing homes. I believe them. Mm-hmm. I, I, they are right. They, they are. And there needs to be changes to how the working conditions, and I don't know what those changes are. I mean, whether you, uh, PSWs maybe are, are doing a different line of work or LPNs or I, I don't know. That's, I'd leave that up to departments and yeah, unions to figure that. They know. Yeah. But you have to get away from just wages. And I know wages are important. I don't want to take that away. But at the same time, let's get the working conditions figured so that when people are going to work, they actually enjoy their job. They're like, happy. They're happy, and, and the residents are happy. There's a great Dan Pink uh, TED Talk, and you can find it too as an RSA animate. <clears throat> you know, with the dry erase marker and it draws okay. quickly, you know, yeah. kind of thing. It's one of the first ones. It's 2010 or so now. What motivates people? Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> it's not money. Right. Money only goes to a certain spot. And then they found with doing different studies um, that if you pay too much money, which won't be the case here, mm-hmm. that it actually acts as a de-incentive. Okay. So it's not a carrot and stick. Right. People work for autonomy mm-hmm. and mastery right. and contribution. Mm-hmm. So if you integrated those three things, according to Dan Pink, into a contract negotiation, I think it would change the whole culture of right. it being more cooperative rather than this conflict and I got to fight to get my inch right right rather than there's only this much money maybe we should move other things around other than dollars because we don't have as many dollars so what else do we have that we can ma- that, make a little more active and then that's the, it. to go to work to be happy yeah it's like you're making a contribution I'm really good at what I do yeah and I can make some decisions right o- over it right <laughs> yeah no for sure and, and that's the, the, you know again that was my biggest frustration it just seemed to be all about you know, I think government last was offering, <coughs> excuse me, about 1.35 percent, um, and union rejected that. Originally, I think they were asking four, yep. um, and the government was saying to us, "Look, if if it goes to arbitration and and this this union gets even three percent, it's an eight million dollar increase every single year on top of what they're paying now, mm-hmm. and 
there's 20 some unions behind this one union yep. that's going to be looking for the same thing. Yep. And he's, and, and so I understand government's point of view and saying, look, we're looking at 150, 200 million dollars a year additional if all of these things, you know, yep. carry on the way they are. So when through that financial lens, they see that as a liability. Right. Rather than as an asset. Well, and, so and how, do you, how do you get those shifts in? And it gets back to the legislation, right? When you have ability to pay in, in legislation, the question for the arbitrator that's sitting in the middle, trying to, here's a union, here's a government, and the mm. arbitrator's trying to figure out where to go with, with each argument. Mm. And then you see under legislation that now the arbitrator has to, def, the, to look at ability to pay. So the province's ability to pay what they're asking, but how does he or she do that? You know, how, how, how do you, you get an $8 billion uh, revenue into the province, well, is a, how, do you, how do you factor that in? And that, this is what we've been saying as opposition, right? Like, I understand the government side to try to put some restraints on it, but on the other hand, it doesn't change anything. Um, if you look, and we researched other jurisdictions that have similar legislation that we passed, never changed a thing, Dennis. Hmm. When, when, when the arbitrator made their decision, some of them went 2.9, some of them went 3.5. Um, it, it, it made no difference. Yeah. Money isn't the key variable. Yeah. Something else is. Interesting. And this can surface in a minority government situation compared mm -hmm. to um, the committee work that got done in the traditional structure. And then right. it hits the floor and then it goes through. Right. Um, Let's change gears a little bit. Um, let's get into MB Power a little bit. Mm -hmm. They're into their smart meter world again. Um, there was the joy exercise in the funding. Um, now there's the small nuclear uh, reactor mm -hmm. strategy. Um, in all of the conversations that you get to be privy to, because you sit at that intersection, is there ever any conversation about getting New Brunswick energy efficient? The first glimmer I saw, and we're still, you know, 750, 760,000 people with maybe a 3 to 5% growth rate over the next so many years, although there might be a bump at some point and we might hit a population of a million because right. of immigration and mm -hmm. um, demographic changes and, and climate change stuff is going to push people around a bit. <clears throat> but are we using a framework or a lens that only is looking at three to five years instead of at 50 to 60 to 70 years? And that's where indigenous cultures could help us with mm -hmm. stretching the link. So what do we need to do now that in 2050, and New Brunswick's energy is self-sufficient? Right. I What I've always advocated for was um, a, a better program for residential um, energy efficiency. So right now the program I think is like $500. Um, I think the most you can get is 1000 if you're if you're refitting your home for energy efficiencies and there's things you have to do to to be able to apply for that i'd like to see that dramatically increased because mm -hmm. to me it's a win-win mm -hmm. if government is willing to you know help offset the cost of putting in geothermal putting in solar uh you know or just simply making your home more energy efficient you know in terms of heat loss it's it's less energy that mb power has to produce to be able to provide to the people of the province mm -hmm. right so I would like to see a greater expansion of that um, benefits people rather than corporations. You know, I mean, they can use it for their own um, use for their home. Mm -hmm. And again, it's it's a win on on MB Powers and how they produce electricity. But there's no question. I mean, you talk to anybody from the minister to average Joe on the street, and everybody knows MB Power um, has been an inefficient mess for too long. And uh, there's things that have to be done better. Uh, internally, I mean, you can't, you can't dump millions of dollars into a program like Joy Scientific, and expect the public to take you serious. I mean, here, here, here is a, an, I've called it a gamble from the start. It's no different than walking into a, a casino and picking a number on the roulette table and hoping for the best. I mean, that's what we did. That's mm -hmm. what MB Power did with uh, with that money. So stuff like that, it 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 gets people's ire, and rightfully so. Does it ever cross your path <clears throat> when New Brunswick gets on this innovation and wanting to be on the cutting edge stuff that almost by design will never be cutting edge, mm. will, will never be that innovative thing because California or Germany or other places, Japan, mm -hmm. with much more resources right. than us will have already figured out most of this stuff beforehand. Right. So this constant push for innovation well, I get it, mm -hmm. but is it us? Is that New Brunswick? Or do we have a, a 
place in that kind of world or are we trying to be something that we're not and we should be refocusing on you know food security and right. protecting environment and mm -hmm. improving our literacy rates and yeah you know because because i get it here's the risk capital go after that mm -hmm. see what comes back maybe we'll cash in big which is your gambling thing mm -hmm. but out there somewhere if we're thinking it i can guarantee Somebody there's a million is, other people for sure with more resources for sure so is or maybe taking that risk capital and steering it somewhere else that actually you know supports us there's lots of stories about angel investors or investors period not investing in new brunswick mm -hmm. they invest their money elsewhere right right yeah for sure and and sometimes as new brunswickers it's hard to uh look at the bigger picture of the globe i mean we're, we're a small province um in a relatively small country population wise not geography we're one of the largest um, but population-wise, small country, small province. Um, I mean, 750,000 people in New Brunswick is the size of a medium city yeah. on, on the globe. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know. So I, I agree. And, and I think what happened, you know, specific to Joy Scientific is, you know, it was, it was a high-risk, um, it was a high-risk investment. And, and my, my opinion is, NB Power doesn't have the capital, or, or I shouldn't say the capital, doesn't have the, the sound fiscal uh, books to be able to take high risk, right? I mean, it's got to be more targeted in terms of uh, calculated risk. If you're going to take a risk, then at least make sure that it's, it's, it's leaning on in your favor. If you're talking innovation, Joy Scientific, I mean, that was just... Uh, it didn't fit. Well, it just And, and that's us sense. looking from the outside and only based on what mainstream media give us. Somewhere mm -hmm. in the MB Power world, there were professionals who felt sure. this is worth the risk. I mean, for sure, some politics came into play at some mm -hmm. point because if this does cash in, then we're going to be at the front end of something. Right. Um, but, you know, if that money was redirected into the retrofitting houses for better energy efficiencies, right. the benefit would be quite immediate within that's the point and, and eight, eight million dollars is is you know a pretty good chunk of change to add to a program for something like that which everybody can benefit ratepayers can actually benefit from that what are we benefiting from eight million dollars to a company that yeah. was you know had a very very low percentage of success even just based on physics i'm not a phys you know when these guys that understand that but people you know tell me that do understand the science that it was just uh well, a careful! Scheme. You're going to wander into your common sense theme here. It's going to come and bite you. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> it reminds me a touch of a conversation I had with John McGarry three years ago mm -hmm. when he was CEO of um, Horizon Health at the time, and I asked him. Um, it was about allocation of large, you know, amounts of funds to mm -hmm. make a situation better. And I said, so John, what would you do to help New Brunswick's population get healthier? Because the shortest route to a less health care costs mm -hmm. is to have a healthier population for sure not keep funding uh, health care yeah uh, repair work call mm -hmm. it that and john without blinking goes i'd take five million out of my budget and i'd put it into the school system and put phys ed back in all the schools wow right yeah. but i can't do that that's, right. uh, i'm in this silo and that's that silo right and he has no conversations across over right so it's not that we don't have the resources we don't have the interconnectedness right as to the general goals for a whole population mm-hmm just like um, if the money from Joy, now that it's surfaced, went to retrofitting houses. Right. So we had the resources. We just allocated them in a, in a goofy direction. Yeah, no, exactly. Yep. Let's slide into uh, the French-English thing a little bit, mm -hmm. um, although it doesn't have to be framed that way. On uh, New Brunswick's French immersion structure and some changes that uh, Minister Cardi is playing with, which is surfaced, you know, it, it's been 10 or 15 years let's tweak it this way tweak it that way right. and uh, and there are many professionals who know of a, a system that will deliver bilingual like a 90 to 95 percent success rate mm -hmm. in delivering bilingual um graduates right. from the system you want to wander into that a bit because that's got to be cooking in the back rooms a touch um, it, what it that is. legislation would look like yeah um there's a chart here and i'll put the picture up I couldn't source, this was a social media thing, it says levels of French proficiency certificates issued for grade 12 students, but they didn't put an asterisk to cite the source, but it looks like something from uh, yep. the Brunswick government. And, and you know, our rates are like 28% um, for grade 12 students that took the proficiency test, and mm -hmm. then there's a grading from their superiors down to the unrateable. And right. Nothing above 10%. 
Well, the Auditor General put out a great report uh, last year, I think it was, and in it she cites that if you take every child that enrolled in French immersion, I think the, the study was from like, or the research was from 2003 up till 2011 or somewhere in that time frame. Um, but anyway, in the, in the, in the Auditor General report, uh, they cited that of all the kids, students that enroll in French immersion, 75% drop out before they graduate. So that's right there, 75% are gone. Of the 25% that remain in French immersion, only 10% of those actually graduate with proficiency required um, by the province. So, and, and, and when you get back to the previous government, they took it from uh, grade three to grade one. So what they're doing, in my mind, is they're taking a system that is clearly failing and that is broken, and they're going to double down on it and, and move it back a couple years. What we have always said is we want a system in, the edu in education where all kids have the opportunity to have conversational French. And same for you know, Francophone areas, you know, conversational English. It works both ways. But what we have now is we have these uh, classes where you know if you enroll in French immersion you go in these classes so they don't and, and, and many educators professionals experts have called it streaming you know because the the, the, the needs aren't the same in, a, in a, an immersion as it is in the other courses so it bothers me because I, I just see another divide another thing where we're taking language and we're causing this other division well they go in this class and they go in this class and, and nobody's winning in the end so let's create a model that works for everybody and um, what I've heard from the Minister of Education, and we have had informal discussions in the past on this. I've had meetings with the Premier on it uh, in discussions, and we all agree. Uh, there's no way around it. The, the immersion program as it is isn't working. It's not, it's not cutting it. And, I mean, we can tweak and tinker around immersion, or we can find a better model. So mm -hmm. the, the Education Minister has, has alluded to the fact that they are going to look at a pilot project um, to, to try out different models. I'm okay with that. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, tomorrow we've got to cut it out and, and, and get rid of it, but let's start looking at some different ways of doing this. So let's get into the stickiest of all places in the Brunswick's narrative, which is the English-French thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so as best I understand from a Francophone perspective, they might feel that getting rid of the dual education system, much like the dual healthcare system, and providing a bilingual education system for all students, like James Sherrard will talk about, so every student in New Brunswick goes through the same education process, mm -hmm. and 98 percent of them come out fluently bilingual. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a worthy goal. Mm -hmm. But to factor in um, in in legislation is the francophone community's desire to preserve its culture. Right. <clears throat> are those mutually compatible? Or are they, by design, uh, diametrically opposed? Because mm -hmm. that's often uh, the argument from the Société des Acadiens Nouveau-Brunswick mm -hmm. about um, we will lose our cultural identity, we are losing, they'll have a sense of loss to it right. and want to preserve mm -hmm. something, whether it's busing on a French bus. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the, the whole potential for change stops. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to disagree to a certain level because I think the best way to preserve your culture is to enhance it by letting others learn it and, and learn a language and, and the culture that you're trying to preserve. I mean, that... Is, is that because you're an Anglophone? Possibly. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I and, and again, I don't... I, I understand um, that aspect. You know, they have you know a strong culture there, which I think enhances the province as a whole, you know, you know completely. You know, but at the same sense, you know, okay, so now we've got, so, and, and, and when you talk education, that's actually protected by the charter. Mm -hmm. So for me to say, we're going to get rid of French schools and, and turn them all, that, that's never going to happen, right? That's because it is it is a constitutional item, whether, and, and I'm not sure I'd want it to happen. But when you're talking about busing, you know, how you get them to school, that's not protected by the charter. When you talk about hospitals, that we have to have Vitalite mm -hmm. here and Horizon here, and they're competing for resources mm -hmm. and everything. That's where I draw the line. That's where I say, okay, well, these things aren't cultural issues. Uh, these are issues of health care. These are issues of transportation, uh, you know, for, for students. Those are when I'm talking about ending duality. That's what I'm talking about. Certain things, like I said, as far as the schools and, 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 uh, and even with the hospitals, I'm not saying that 
French hospitals are no longer going to be French. I mean, if you're in a predominantly French region of the province, I would expect your hospital still going to operate the same way it does today. But I'm saying the administration as a whole from the from the province mm -hmm. should be under one system. So how do you deal with that's being turned around as being anti-French? I, I don't know. I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, when I make statements that say I want all kids to be able to learn both languages when they graduate, how can you call that anti-French? You know, when I'm saying uh, merging the two health authorities into one health authority, allowing the francophone hospitals to continue to be, if you're, if you're Vitalité today, you're, you're a French hospital, continue to do that. That doesn't have to change, you know. But when it talks about resources, when it talks about administration, when it talks about standard of care, all of those things, it's under one system. Um, I think it would reduce cost. I think it would uh, it would reduce the division that we sometimes see when it comes to those things. Um, and it, I, I think all we bring people together. How much did this surface during the paramedics negotiation? Uh, a, a little bit. If you look back last fall, uh, and that's a great example, um, you know, we, we always had the issue of paramedics were telling us en masse that language was playing a big part in whether they could get permanent full-time work and all sorts. So last fall we were able to change that, where everybody kind of agreed, let's do this in a way that if you're a unilingual paramedic, French or English unilingual, you're, you're going to be able to get that full-time employment. Because before they couldn't even take a mortgage out. I mean, it was six-month contracts, right? Mm -hmm. It was unfair uh, and, and ineffective. So we, we were able to fix that last fall. Um, then, of course, recently was the reclassification of paramedics, which really had nothing to do with language. That was just, you know, they, they should be recognized as medical professionals instead of, you know, what they were in before. So, mm -hmm. um, And thanks for wandering into that. Um, I sort of want to keep pressing into that because healthcare reform is going to happen at some point. Mm -hmm. It has to. Um, and what I'm after is if we keep digging through each of the different themes, so from paramedics to healthcare delivery to education, um, at some point we need to accept that we all live here together. Right. And it's like in the 60s and the 70s, things went through a period of natural division. Mm -hmm. Specialization, niche marketing, uh, that was mm -hmm. kind of the sign of the times. But now we get to 2000, 2010, and everything's in separate silos, and there's no integration anymore, right. and everyone's working at cross purposes. But it's like we've lost the ability to let go of the old way of doing it right. and slide into a new way of doing it, mm -hmm. and which is a creative again. In 2020 to 2030, we better be pretty creative because a lot of the stuff that's coming <laughs> yeah. for 2050, 60 is going to demand that. But we we got to let go of some of the old hurts. We got to let go of, of some of the old fears mm -hmm. and find where the new ways is. And it, maybe a minority government's a great place for that to kind of start yep. to foster and foment a little bit. But healthcare, you know, at some point, you know, it's been identified there's ten or twelve hospitals, I think around ten, that aren't functioning as best they could and don't need to be there anymore. Right. But that's not to say the healthcare delivery won't be there. And that's, the, the, you just nailed it. Because I'll give you an example, a personal example. So in Minto, mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't remember if, I think it was a liberal government build a, built a hospital in Minto. Beautiful facility. And it ran as a 24-7 emergency hospital for, for several years. And it was uh, the Lord government that came in and converted that 24-7 hospital into a community health clinic. Um, I remember back then, I mean, when, when that went out, uh, there were hundreds of people protesting. They were bouncing on the top of cars in front of Centennial. Building. Oh, it was wild. <laughs> I mean, it was, they just figured, you know, this is the end of healthcare in New Brunswick. But I tell you today, Karen McGrath, the CEO of Horizon, made a statement in committee not too long ago when I was questioning her about the, the, the clinic in Minto. She called it the crown jewel of the province in terms of community clinics. It's an amazing uh, uh, function because I can walk in there anytime yep. uh, Monday to Friday and I can be in and out in a half an hour and see a doctor and it's done and then you look at the deck in Fredericton yep. and they're waiting 8, 10, 12 hours yep. so there's no question you, you can't take a province the size of New Brunswick and I think right now there's 22 full hospitals in the province yep. um, what city of 750,000 people have 22 hospitals in them Right. So at some point you have to, and I would much rather have a specialized uh, care in a region of the province. The heart center is a perfect example. I had open heart surgery in 2013 
And I can tell you from the time that I went to that heart center in St. John, uh, the time I was admitted to the time I left was exceptional service. I mean exceptional service. Now, I, if, if we had a different system and we had all these heart surgeries all over the province, I would not have gotten exceptional service. I would have got, you know, maybe decent service. And this is what I'm getting to. There, there, I, I think there has to be specialized centers that do specialized things, have your health clinics uh, in the communities, because you don't want to deny anybody health care, right? And if they had to close that out in Minto completely, hmm. that would have been a different story. My interview with John McGarry again three years ago, four years ago, um, so, and John was lovely because he was very upfront, yep. very relaxed and, and good, you know, and <clears throat> so he got talking about the need to close some of the smaller hospitals, replace it with the Minto example. He said, New Brunswick's perfectly situated for regional healthcare delivery. Mm -hmm. And he had a very clear idea in his mind what that would look like, mm -hmm. um, how that plays into politics became the issue. Right. Um, we did the interview July 20th, 21st or so, just before the New Brunswick Day weekend. And the word had, or the decision had been made about shifting the St. Stephen Hospital into a, another type of facility, okay. modeled a bit after the Minto one, I mm -hmm. suspect. And at a certain number of surgeries and such would move down the road to St. Uh, St. John. Mm -hmm. So you got to drive the hour and a half on the number one to get that done. Right. There was a group typically that created to protest, save our hospital. Mm -hmm. It's New Brunswick Day weekend, and that's where Premier Brian Glant was uh, on that weekend. And the news clips all that weekend were about him saying, I'm going to save your hospital for you. Right. And for me, there's a living example of here's what the professionals know right. to make uh, us more efficient and save health care costs right. and improve improve care because you can then recruit right. and, and retain. Right. Um, and here's political and i'm not picking on them but this is what happened yeah saying i in front of three or four hundred people saying i'll save your hospital for you right but it's totally counter to what so to me the tipping point is the people right someone needed to let them know that the mental example mm -hmm. is what we're trying to do all around the province to this level right. primary care right and and there's a lot of other professionals i'm thinking of ken mcgeorge mm -hmm. and, who get this <laughs> absolutely yeah but can't get any traction on what the changes look like because joe q public will push and say save my hospital right. which is a 1960s model right when you're going to get into telecare you're going to get into doing interviews or medical things through um video conferencing now right right and and it's funny you mentioned that because i was speaking to a physician the other day that's he's launching his own business here in new brunswick uh, and that's what he's doing is is skype uh um appointments yep. right so um and, and he brought up the idea that uh you know what if you had a, a clinic in a rural area where you can't recruit enough doctors but you say you've got a nurse practitioner a nurse on staff and you walk into the clinic the nurse practitioner does what he or she needs to do and then you've got to skype in with a physician that may be in fredericton or moncton or wherever yep. still write prescriptions still diagnose you know your condition whatever um we got to look outside the box here i i am convinced of that and I've always said that I would much rather have, when healthcare is, is precious to people, right? And, and when, when I want healthcare, I want good healthcare. I don't want average healthcare. I don't want okay healthcare. I want exceptional healthcare. And if I'm not getting it now, what can we do to make sure that I do? And I use, again, the heart, the heart center as an example. There's one place in province that does this, and I think it also services other areas, other provinces. Mm -hmm. um, exceptional, exceptional. Um, but again, if I have a head cold and I need to go see my doctor, um, you know, on Tuesday afternoon, I can walk down to my local clinic and go in and see him. Yep. We have about 10 or 15 minutes or so left. Um, do you think the French English thing will ever settle? Flipped another way. Will we ever find a union or a complementary space where it all clicks? Another interview four years ago, Jean-Marie Nadeau, mm -hmm. uh, former president of Société des Acadiens de Nouveau-Brunswick, mm -hmm. we got talking about the busing thing because it was hot at that time. Mm -hmm. And what struck me from doing research was that lost in the whole thing about, you know, that one child at the end of that road when the French bus goes down to get them, and then right beside it is where the English bus goes down to get the other child. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Nova Scotia was paying roughly $900 per student for busing. Just, you know, here's the budget, there's the number of students, you divide mm -hmm. one. 
New Brunswick was paying 550. So in somewhat comparative, it was close to apples to apples. Mm -hmm. We were still 30, 35% better than what Nova Scotia was doing. Right. But that was lost in the discussion of, you know, there's two buses going down the same street. They could easily pick up the kids to then go to the schools. Right. Lost in that is that, well, a lot of them should be walking to school. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and, and again, the minister and I have had this conversation as well on, on you know, how, how far is that area where the buses are going to go? You know, I think now it's two kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you live within two kilometers of the school, you don't get busing. You know, you, yeah. you walk. Or using municipal systems if they would yeah. in turn adapt to yeah. it. And the issue, too, in New Brunswick, you know, when, you, when it comes to, you know, the dual education systems is it's not just the busing that is a cost, but I think what a lot of people don't know is there's actual uh, private contracts that are given to taxi drivers, uh, you know, different organizations and companies that will actually pick up kids, too, in different areas and bring them into the schools. Um, and that gets exceptionally costly. Now, I don't know whether that, I don't think that number is factored in to the 550 of, of just the buses running, but that is exceptional cost. So, you know, we're still trying to work the numbers out, see exactly mm -hmm. where we're at. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I want at the end of the day is is what makes sense. And, and if, if that means one bus goes down, picks up a group of kids, French and English, brings them back mm -hmm. uh, to a certain uh, checkpoint or a school or whatnot, and then other buses mm -hmm. take them, whatever. I mean, they, they can figure it out. It's this hard line that, that, that frustrates me where it says, if you are a, a student going to a French school, it's a hard line. You will not be on the English bus, which then, and vice versa. Yeah, which then begs the other the other question, because I want to throw a monkey wrench into that whole narrative right now, is if if any school that's within a municipality that has public busing, mm -hmm. and they create, Kingston came up with free bus passes for students to take okay. the bus and change the culture of the bus, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the culture of the community. How do you then support the argument that it has to be a francophone bus picking up a francophone student when in that community the way you're going to get the school is on the city bus right because you've got a free pass right and they've accommodated the the routes in order to facilitate that which reduces co2 it right that's what i mean about 10 15 20 years from now we've got to make some changes in 2020 that show up there yeah for sure um, and so somewhere along the way that hard line has to shift into what do we need to do together right and still preserve the thing that you were looking for, for in sure. the first place yeah thoughts into because that'll be the toughest one in new brunswick politics do you can pick any topic healthcare, um joy scientific mm -hmm. or you know and it's going to come down at some point as it whittles its way through to the two cultures right and you know you know what i i i've got to say when you talk to average new brunswicker and, and you know whether he's a he or she's a francophone or an anglophone when you talk to those people there's no animosity very seldom i mean you get you get your radicals on both sides but but general population people get along you know and there's no animosity about the, against french or the french against the english average joe doesn't feel that way well we're one degree of separation well and but but yeah <laughs> but the, right and the issue is when you take it to a political level right mm. And then you've got uh, you've got organizations like the S A and B, which, in my opinion, take a very radical approach to these things. In the Anglo society, and you, and you, the right? Other you've side. got the other side, which is you know. So if you can cut through all of that and just see where where most New Brunswickers' minds are at, um, I've used it before. I mean, again, growing up in Minto and the coal mines, we had all kinds of cultures. We had Italian, we had Dutch, we had French, we had English. They worked together. Uh, you know, they learned each other's cultures throughout the years, and even today. Uh, there's elderly people, there, there's one lady I can think of um, in Minto, uh, you know, she's French and, and she, she, she speaks a little bit of English, uh, but not a lot, but yet she loves Minto, she loves the community, people love her. There's no animosity when it, when it gets down to the ground level, it's when it gets to a political level and government make, in my opinion, foolish decisions based on which way they're being pulled in the day, yeah. that's where problems arise. And then that would speak to the merits of a minority government system mm -hmm. rather than uh, the want to be in power system. Right. Because they will play for that division to be in power. Right. Whereas a minority government structure would play to where's the cooperative element here mm -hmm. so that people can see the good that comes from this. And exactly. Then su support it. And, and I like the 
comparison because that's the monkey wrench I was going to do uh, with uh, the coal mine and all the different cultures there. Mm -hmm. um, I think Heartland, New Brunswick is considered the most culturally diverse is that right? community. Yeah, yeah, because of McCain Industries and all the people yep. that they brought in. Um, because at some point, if New Brunswick pushes immigration as much as they say they do, even mm -hmm. with all the obstacles that are in place, because there's always stories about I came here from Australia or I came here from to be a nurse and then right. I run into all these obstacles or if you don't speak English all the right. barriers to acquiring the second language because the program used to be two years now it's three years and mm -hmm. I can't wait that long to all those obstacles we put in place but that said at some point New Brunswick will start to experience what Montreal Toronto the other places have experienced decades ago where you go to the corner store and you need to speak fragmented versions of three or four languages right just for the sake of getting along because you, you get along with, with, yeah. with each other and you figure out a way to do it. Right. Which which totally shifts the entrenched um, protect my rights thing right. rather than uh, my rights are okay and then yours are right here beside mine right. and then this is us as a community. Right. And, and this is what we've said all along and, and again getting back to the paramedic file as it relates to language. Um, look at a city of Toronto. <coughs> Excuse me. You get paramedics that operate in Toronto they deal with multiple language. I mean, French and English, they'd laugh at that. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, you know, I'm sure they've got Mandarin and, and all different types of dialects. Yeah. And they have, um, they have a system in place that doesn't matter what language you speak, they're going to be able to communicate, you know, to be able to get you to the hospital you need to go. And I've always laughed because here in New Brunswick, we can't deal with two. Yeah. You know, and why can't we? What, what, what is it that's the barrier to, to allow us to do that? And yeah. And again, without infringing anybody's rights, but just bringing it down to a rational level where you can you can make it work. The uh, one last thing I want to touch on to capture it on on, on tape, uh, so I can catch you two years from now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, food, food security. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of those things that still isn't top of mind. We're still going to hear about MB Power. We're still going to hear about IT innovation. We're still going to hear about government debt and deficit. We're still going to hear about healthcare things. And yet, food is one of those things that has a impact on multiple things at the same time. It creates social cohesion. It creates a level of economy. Mm -hmm. um, it creates a level of health. And yet, we're still not talking about food. In your world so far, has it been so crazy busy that you're just reacting all the time to what's coming at you? Or do you have windows when you can push a new narrative, although for New Brunswick it's actually an old narrative, right. um, and that actually would improve things. Back to John McGarry talking about putting phys ed into school systems to create healthier population. Mm -hmm. If more people had access to healthy food and if it was part of our culture, your health care costs will go down within 20 years. Right, right. But no political party is pushing food or food security. The Green Party sort of does, but mm -hmm. then it, it never comes up as weaving its way into an NB power conversation right. or an economic conversation. Right. Or, well, and, and I think, you know, whether it's food security or whatever issue is, is top of mind, you, you have to be at the table to be able to at least get some movement on those issues. Hmm. And, you know, for me, Dennis, when I got elected, I, I had an option. I, you know, we had an option as the three of us. We can either, again, be in perpetual opposition, sitting with the Liberals and Greens and just oppose everything the government does, <laughs> or we can come to the table and say, okay, here's the things that we want to push, and they say these are the things they want to push, and we try to find that mutual understanding. Do I get 100% of what I want every time? Absolutely not. Do they get 100%? No, they don't. Mm -mm. This is called compromise and negotiation. But you have to be able to do that if you're going to push an agenda. So if you if food security is a big issue, um, you know, to sit on the fringes of opposition mm -hmm. and say, we want food security, da 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 What's it going to really accomplish? Might create some public awareness, but I don't know if it's going to get anything done. But if you're sitting at the table, mm. and this is a big issue uh, for you, whatever it is, at least you've got an opportunity then to say, well, look, this is this is an issue that we want to see addressed. Someone's got to champion it at that level at some point in time. Right. So thanks for mapping out where where it's hard to do mm -hmm. or not as easy as it seems as just creating a document and saying we got so to talk about this now. What, what do you think Dennis, that that would look like when we talk about food security is it more locally grown farms uh, type could, of thing or 
from all the different interviews, um, the pleasure of sitting. I'm in not this, the interview, but yeah, it's just yeah, a conversation, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. But but it's good to get the ideas out, though. Um, Christian Michaud from um, Farmers Association of Brunswick, and um, Ted Wiggins and Amanda Wildeman from five years ago mm-hmm. interview um, with the uh, National Farmers Union in New Brunswick. Amanda had this great soundbite I've used ever since. If people would just allocate thirteen dollars a week from their groceries, not thirteen new dollars, but right. thirteen dollars to buying local produce. <clears throat> it's an impact of 100 million for New Brunswick farmers. Uh-huh. Boom. There's uh, um, Edouard Alain and Don Terrio from Centre Communautaire Saint-Anne and their program called CDC, mm-hmm. which is locally grown. It's a social enterprise <clears throat> and it puts healthy food in the school system. Right. And it's taken it uh, in Fredericton at Centre Communautaire and uh, it calls Saint-Anne. It's taken five years for the grade niners to start eating the salad at lunchtime. Okay. <laughs> Just, you know, so they talk about, you know, the roll in rate, but the economic impact is huge. Mm-hmm. And and to the point where local farmers if they knew they had that demand, they would then plant accordingly. Right. And Levi Lawrence tried to do that with his real food connections back right. 5 6 years ago. So all around my world there's these little bits that are popping up that well, would have a significant impact on if they would all meet, but someone needs to champion that meat. Right. New Brunswick used to be the three F's, a friend once told me, you know, identity, forestry, fishing, and farming. Right. Forestry and fishing get all kinds of attention. The farming thing is Very lost. Little. We've got almost a million acres of unused farmland. Right. We've got 30-year-olds looking for something that's fruitful yeah. in, in general. And we've got a access to the same New England market that we're doing for energy. Right, right. Why doesn't food ever surface as one of our economic drivers? That, that's a good point, and and you know you're probably right that it's it's an untapped uh, it's an untapped enterprise there that that could help the the economy. I was at the at the Ville in Marysville, um, and and I was so impressed because they took me through this little garden that they have set up, and they have uh, uh, like I don't know the terminology, but you know they had all the plants and and the fruits and uh, the yep. vegetables growing in this this little greenhouse type thing but it was all run on like uh, uh, if i remember correctly it was fish you know the the droppings yeah. from the fish the, the new greenhouse that they got the money to build in and it's complete it's, so closed circuit system yeah the fish are on the bottom the water comes up and it feeds uh, it's hydroponics and right it trickles down and, and it i mean what, what a what a you know just a just a beautiful thing and that, and then to make that on a larger scale i mean yeah it, it, yeah. it would make sense yeah it's, okay so then a year from now, we'll interview again and we'll say, so how did that bill go? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. I'm always open to the, you know? to the discussion, yeah. I suspect if someone would spearhead that, you would find a groundswell of people looking for the catalyst. Right. Because over the past 10 or 15 years, there's been more and more conversations mm-hmm. of uh, food security and getting uh, good food to people and then improving health and stuff. So. Yeah. Um, five minutes. Uh, how do you want to close out? Soft question, you know, what what's uh, what's coming in front of you for the next um, year? I think I think the two big issues that we're going to see uh, that we we discussed was healthcare mm-hmm. is going to be a, a big one, and healthcare has to be tackled. And and I I really Dennis don't think we can tinker around the healthcare file. I don't. I, it's not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're at a crisis mode, overcrowding, services shutting down. Quick question. Yep. Is two point one billion dollars enough to deliver health care to seven hundred and sixty thousand people? Um, that's that's a good question. Um, what I do find about health care, it's like this big fiscal black hole. I mean you could you could add an extra hundred million into it and it just seems to you know, to go somewhere. So I, I'm not sure money's gonna be the answer. I, I think it's gotta be about uh, efficiency and, and getting those local clinics more integrated into the community. And if you want to know how to do that, again, just look to Minto because that 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 has a, all different types of services. Um, and 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 I think if that was mimicked, and uh, another one is um, not healthcare, but uh, the Stanley Nursing Home, hmm. um, not a hospital or a clinic, of course, but very they they've they've done a nursing home without walls, right? So it connects to the community. The community connects to the nursing home. Everybody wins in the end. So I think healthcare's got to be along the same lines. Final thoughts? Look, it's been uh, it's been an incredible year and a half, uh, <laughs> you know, to say the least. Um, again, I want to do everything I can, um, you know, to, to ensure people in this province that they have a stable government. Um, 
And, uh, you know, the Premier, to his credit, him and I have got a good relationship. We have lots of discussions. We don't always agree. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're able to, to keep things moving along and, and I think uh, making significant improvements. Tax reform's got to be a big thing that we need to see some movement on. I talked to the Premier about that on many occasions. So it's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting year, to say the least. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for watching. If you like the work we do, go to the dentistreport.ca, click on PayPal or Patreon. Be good. Have fun. Love each other.